Hey, so we are, um, we are continuing our series uh, called Great Expectations, where we're taking uh, a bit of a deep dive on the person of the Holy Spirit. And I think that it's been, um, it's just been uh, refreshing to my soul. Hopefully it's been encouraging and refreshing to your soul. It's part of uh, a greater vision that uh, we believe the Lord's given us here called Vision 2020. Um, expect greater things. And uh, basically it, it comes from, you know, I, I referenced the verse uh, that, uh, that w- when the members came in from John uh, 14 where Jesus promises that you're going to do these, these great works that he's doing and even greater works than these. And so what we believe that to mean in its full and fullness is seeing his mission go out in greater and even more significant the ways um, than, than he saw in his three years. And so um, if we could get that slide up that's got that verse from John that, that gives us kind of like our, our context for all that we're going to be doing over the next two years. Okay, this is our anchor verse right here is that we're believing that we're going to do the works that Jesus did and even greater works. And so Jesus did a lot of different things, but the main thing that he did And the the main thing that all of these other works pointed to was the fact that he had come to see, like, people far from God find a home with God. He didn't come to make people better. He came to take people who were spiritually dead and make them spiritually alive. And um, he pronounced himself to be the physician who had come for the sick. And we, first of all, understand ourselves to be sick, and then we get to be healed by Jesus and go out and bring others into that healing. And so that's what we're believing that we are doing uh, together. And there's a culture that supports that. There's four, there's four sort of themes to that culture. There's the theme of uh, expectation and, and hospitality and empowerment and invitation. We're preaching through, through those themes throughout the year. And, and uh, today, we've got a couple more weeks. To the, today and next week, uh, we'll finish up uh, expectation, expecting greater things. But in order to expect great things, we're going to need somebody besides ourselves, right? Like, you're going to need somebody besides me. You're going to need somebody besides whoever else might be on staff here. You're going to need uh, somebody besides the, the DNA leaders. And, and, and beside, you're going to need something besides a particular building or even vision. You are going to need, we are going to need another person. And Jesus was clear that it's really good for him to go away so that the Holy Spirit would come. And, that, and that's why we've been doing so many weeks on the Holy Spirit, because that's Jesus' main strategy for life today. It's like he was here for three years, now he's gone, now he's given us this main, stra- this person. And so I don't know what your um, history is with this person, how accustomed you are to the person of the Holy Spirit, but if Jesus is saying basically your life depends on this person, we should get to know him. We should know what his personality is like and, and, and things he loves and things he hates. We should know how he works. We should know the fact that if we've been gifted by the Holy Spirit. There's some, there's some cool things that, that God's Spirit has given to us. And, um, and you know, so we've just, we've just walked through that. And, and I've, it's been awesome to hear some different voices. And I just want to say a, a special thanks to some of the voices that you've heard. You've heard from Sam. Um, you've heard from Daniel. And you've heard from uh, John, John Hicks. And um, can we just thank them and just say, guys, that was awesome. Um, really appreciate you guys being a part of that and, and, and hopefully you guys are going to be able to hear more and more from, from uh, some of those voices uh, we're excited about that so we're believing that this is going to be a real pursuit that's what we're looking at today we're looking at this idea that it's, it's, a, it's a real um, pursuit of a real person and, and as, as we kind of think through what that might mean, we're, we're going to be looking uh, in, in the book of Ephesians to give us our anchor verse today. And so if you can open your Bibles, we'll be in Ephesians chapter 5. And as you know, with, with any person or with anything, it's, it's one thing to study about them. It's another thing to actually pursue them, to, to go after them. And um, although we are recipients of grace and God's love, it never leaves us where it finds us, and it actually calls us into these greater things. So, so as we receive God's love, and as God's love is poured out upon us more and more and more, we actually find ourselves more and more and more motivated not to earn anything, but to receive and experience more of what we already have. And so today we're going to be looking at this, this pursuit that the Apostle Paul and Jesus call us into, that we are actually called to get after something. 
as it pertains to the Holy Spirit. Like it's not, it's not simply a passive relationship that we have a role in this um, relationship and, and it's, a, it's a significant role. So I'm in uh, Ephesians 5, uh, beginning in verse 15. We'll see, we'll see sort of the, our, our main camp out verse here, but this is the context. Paul's writing to the church in Ephesus and he begins this chapter of a letter that went out to, to all of the churches in Ephesus because it was always a unified movement. At least that was the, that was the theme and, and the, the desire of Jesus, that it would be, be together. So if a letter was written to a particular city like Galatia, uh, any of the cities that you might see Paul writing a letter to, it would be a letter that would circulate amongst all the churches. So it would be like the word for the church, although there would be different sort of expressions of that church. And and so it's a unified letter that begins by saying, therefore, be imitators of me and walk in love. Walk in love. And so the context of this is love. Well, well how would we do that? And then he gets, gets into uh, more of the emphasis on the Holy Spirit because it's, it's really impossible for us to walk in this divine love outside of divine help. Verse 15, look carefully then how you walk. Not as unwise, but as wise, making the best use of the time, because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. And do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery. But be filled with the Spirit, addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart, giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. So as, as we can see here, there's, there's, there's some things to this uh, pursuit that become evident once you're actually pursuing him. You, you can kind of see that in that passage sort of down, down below, there's, there's some things that show up that will let you know whether you're pursuing more of God or not. And we're going to talk about what some of those words mean, be filled and things like that. But just the general idea, I want to, I want to give you guys sort of like some of the metrics. Am I being filled with the Holy Spirit? Am I pursuing more of God? Which is a similar, similar task. Well, how would I know? Well, this is how I would know. I, I'd look to my Bible. I, you know, I wouldn't look to how I feel, thank goodness, because my emotions like are like the roller coasters all over the place and I wouldn't look to um, necessarily always how I'm doing because I don't even know what that means some of the times so I wouldn't I wouldn't look to um, some of the some of the metrics that that the world puts out I would simply look to some of the metrics that the Word of God puts out and this is ways that you can know that you're being filled with the Holy Spirit that you're pursuing the Holy Spirit um, Here's some of the results. It's, in, it's what I just read. You would be addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Okay, so we'd be talking to one another, and our talk would go beyond the fact that my son has a, a 2 o'clock baseball game today. Although that's super cool. Like, it would go beyond how the heat did. It, it, would, go, it would go beyond... Uh, what, what's going on in the political world. Th- those things are important and critical, and you can see the gospel in them, but we would have an addressing toward one another, even in the midst of those things, and the way that we interacted with one another would be filled with, with the truth from the psalms and, and hymns and spiritual songs, and, and it would actually be, be biblical how we were, how we were addressing uh, one another. And, and there'd be singing and making melody to the Lord in your heart. So obviously the author of this letter has heard me sing, and he's asked me to sing in my heart. <laughs> I think it's kind of like one interpretation of that, but, but a bit more, seriously. It's like, what's going on in your heart? You know, there's a melody right now in your heart. If you're quiet enough, you can hear it. Some of us have, have a melody um, of danger. It's almost like the jaws. Like you got... You're like, dude, when is this guy going to say something that, like, you know, irks me or triggers me? Or, like, what about that conversation I have to have after church? Or what about, you know, Wednesday night when I'm going to meet this boy? But some of us um, just have some, like, light classical music going on. You're just kind of like, yeah, I'm here. You know, it's cool. I'm chilling. I'm just kind of, like, in this harmonious place. Some of us have 
these songs of like wonder and delight that we're singing continually to Jesus. And sometimes the music helps us to sing them out. And sometimes the music helps us to remind our hearts what's already going on. And we, we have like a song in our heart unto the Lord. It's a song of thanksgiving. It's a song of rejoicing. It's a song that can sing in the face of cancer. It's a song that can sing in the face of relational difficulty. It's a song that can sing in the face of unemployment. It's a song that can sing in the, in the place of great blessing. And, and so what the scriptures tell us is that there's, there's going to be a song in our hearts of great thanksgiving at at all these times, and we'll be making melody to the Lord in our hearts, giving thanks always, giving thanks always. So one of the ways that you can sort of gauge yourself on like, am I being filled with the Spirit? Am I pursuing the Spirit? Am I pursuing the things of God? Is what kind of gratitude level are you living with? Because your gratitude and the work of the Spirit often go hand in hand. It says that you would always be giving thanks unto the Lord uh, for everything in, in the name of Christ and that we would be submitting to one another, that, that we would learn what it is, whether, whether we, have, we find ourselves in a leadership role or not, but that, that our, our chief role in life would be submitting to Jesus and out of that submission, finding ways to submit lovingly to one another, to seeing the other flourish, even at our great expense. And so um, th- these, are, these are some of the signs that, that God gives us in order to, to let us know, hey, this is what it would be like for you to actually be being filled with the Spirit. Now, some of these things uh, are, are things that you can participate in that help you to be filled with the Spirit. But in this context, they are set as a result of being filled um, with the Spirit. And so what we're going to look at today is like, what does it mean to prepare ourselves? What does it mean to prepare ourselves? to be filled with the Spirit, because that's, that's sort of where the passage takes us if, if we, we're going to kind of unpack some of these words. And so um, the idea here is that we would continually be filled with the Spirit. You have an outline uh, that hopefully will, will help you follow along here, and, and we'll, we'll walk our way through it. And, and we're, we're now at the section where, where we're talking about, and, and I, it seems like Paul's calling us into um, a preparation if we look at some of the original language. And, and first we, we see that there, there's, a, there's a call to get under the influence of something. Um, Paul says, don't be drunk with wine. And, and so we're, we're all familiar with the fact that um, if you are drunk with wine, one of the key characteristics is that you, you, you place yourself under the influence of something outside of you. And it actually does something to you. Uh, it, 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 it like changes your personality. You're still the same person, but you're not. You're kind of like this alternate version of who you were when you're sober. And, and that, that influence, man, it, it changes you. It brings things out in you that, that for the most part, you would probably say, I'm not, like, I'm not super pumped when I'm under that influence. It has, as a matter of fact, led me to a place of despair, death disease. It's taken things from me. And so here's what Paul wants to say. Understand that I'm going to call you to be under the influence. It's just under the influence of something that's going to bring life to both you and to those around you. I'm calling you to be under the influence of something that will bring things out in you that you can't get when you're sober. I want to say that again. Let's let's start with sobriety. Drunkenness takes you to, to death and disease and loss. When you're just kind of like, let's just say, spiritually sober, at least in this metaphor, you're just kind of average. It's kind of like plugging along. Kind of got that classical music playing. But here's what Paul's suggesting. Uh, he, he's not calling us to um, the average Christian lifestyle. He's saying, I want you to be under the influence of the Holy Spirit so that if you were to use the idea of intoxication, like, like be intoxicated, but not with a substance that takes, but with a person that gives. With a person that allows you to be and do things that you could never be and do without him. Um, David Guzik writes about this. He, he says it's, it's like um, the, the difference between a depressant and a stimulant. So alcohol is a depressant that like loosens you and it, it leaves you over here. 
and the Holy Spirit is more like a stimulant, which is, I think, him affirming the use of, like, coffee. That's, that's not good exe- exegesis. I'm just saying, you know, like, he, he's, he's saying that there's two, there's two things here, and one kind of is a depressant, and the other is a stimulant, and the Holy Spirit is the stimulant that brings the best out of you. Be filled. Um, be filled. Be constantly filled is what that actually means. Be constantly being filled. So if you have a Bible, you, you, you brought, it, brought it on your app or whatever, if you can highlight sort of that word, um, be filled, because there's a lot behind it. It actually means play uh, in the in the original. It's got kind of three emphasis to it. The one is a reference to wind and sort of being pushed in one direction. Um, the other is an emphasis on a permeation, um, almost like an Alka-Seltzer when they drop in the, in the liquid and it permeates the whole thing. And the one is an emphasis on being dominated, like that you're, you have that influence that actually just absolutely controls you and dominates you. Play Roo, be filled. Um, the reason that, that you see the, the boat here is, is we're going to use the metaphor of, of setting your sail setting yourself, that, that we would prepare ourselves for the filling of the Spirit to do all three of those things, to be the wind that our sails catch, that leads us and guides us, to be what saturates and permeates our personalities and animates our words and our motivations and our heart, and to be the thing that completely dominates us as though it were the storm in a positive and life-giving way. Be constantly filled. It's important that we understand the tense of this particular word because it's not a one-time thing. Uh, being filled with the Spirit in this context is not a, a one-time occasion. It's not something that happens um, just once and then you're sort of good to go for the rest of your life. Now let me, let me do just a, a brief theological talk here on, on the, the, the Holy Spirit. Every believer, every person who comes to faith in Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior receives at that moment the Holy Spirit. So, so here's what happens. Like, you're born, we're, we're far from God. We don't know it until somebody like, um, hopefully lovingly, it might have been obnoxiously, tells you you're a sinner and you, you like need to repent and trust Jesus. And if it comes on a street corner, you're like, what? But if it comes to a friend who loves you, you're like, really? It depends. It might be the street corner that gets you too. It just, it's just like God works in all different ways. But, but at some point in your life, if, if, you, if, if you have the Holy Spirit, you were far from God, you realize that there's a God that's just and holy and should crush you, but in his love for you, decided to crush Christ in your place. Jesus died your death and on the third day was brought back from the dead. You start believing that. You start believing that the cross is really personal and includes your pornography. It includes the pornography that doesn't involve a computer and simply involves your eyes. It involves your, your, your gossip. It involves uh, your wandering thoughts. It involves your anxiousness. It involves all those things. You begin to understand that the cross is not some sort of Ro- Roman torture device that happened way back there, but that the cross is intimately tied to what you do and don't do. It's got your name written all over it. And you don't stop there. You believe that actually Jesus overcame that. So you now, by faith in what he's done, you no longer have to live in that shame. You can say that used to be who I am and I still struggle with some of those things, but it's not who I am in the eyes of God because that's all been forgiven in what Christ has done for me, taking my place and my punishment. When a person comes to faith and repentance, when a person, person understands that here and then it travels to their heart, And they actually turn from life that used to be lived over here. And they're like, Jesus, you're not just my savior. Like, I I don't just believe there was a transaction there, but you're also my, I believe in you as my treasure. When a person comes to faith in Christ like that, and they they surrender one life for, for his life, what happens is they're forgiven of sin, they're adopted into the family of God, and they're given God's Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit comes and dwells in them like he did in the Old Testament temple. Now, you don't lose the Holy Spirit. It's not like the Holy Spirit can, comes and goes and comes and goes. There was some of that going on in the Old Testament. You can see some of that. But in the, in the New Testament, w- when a person comes to faith in Christ, God's Holy Spirit comes to live within them. It's a guarantee. It's like a deposit. Like, you're going to get the fullness of God when he comes back. But right now, God's Spirit's going to live within you. So what, what Paul's talking about here is not reconversion after reconversion. 
What he's talking about is the fact that although we have the Holy Spirit at all times, there are different times and seasons of our life, even sometimes day to day, when we will experience what is already ours. There are things that wear away at us. They're, they're the world, our flesh, the enemy. There are things that cause us not necessarily to like lose the Holy Spirit, but not to experience God's Spirit and God's love the way that he intended us to. And so what Paul is saying is all the time you should be seeking to be filled with God's Holy Spirit. You have him already, but you should be seeking more of God all the time. If you want to know what your life mission is, seek more of God. The rest will all fall into place. And so that's being filled with the Spirit. That's what it means. Like, God, I, I always want the most of you in every situation. I realize that in this life, I'm not going to have it. And so Paul's like, seek it. Pursue it. Come after it. It's the healthiest thing that you can do. A couple more things just on, on the word study here is um, it's, it's not something that can be uh, manufactured. There's no system to it. There's no formula. Like, if you do these three things, you're going to get this. No, that's not how it works. Um, and it's, it's, so it's passive, but it's imperative. And what that means is it's not an, it's not an option. It's not like, well, maybe I'll seek to be, maybe I'll do that thing that he was talking about. Maybe I'll seek after God and, and want his wind to blow in my sail like, like Casey was talking about today. But tomorrow, I'm going to take, it's like my Sabbath, so I'm going to take a day off from God. You know, I'm going to rest up, and then I'll get back to doing the things of God, you know, especially closer to Wednesday, because that's my Bible study, and I'll feel weird going into Bible study, not having, like, read my Bible. And then I'll kind of get a few days, no, no, no. Paul's like, man, all the time, this is the pursuit of our heart. Passive, but imperative. So, this idea of pursuit. I was thinking of my daughter, uh, Caroline. And she is, uh, she's one uh, from, from a young age who has desired um, to be in the gym and to play volleyball at the highest level. And there was a time in, I'm talking about like five years old and then even on. Uh, and there was a time when she was maybe around 14, 15 years old where we sat down and we had a conversation and she asked me this question. What would it take for me to not basically just be a good volleyball player, but to be, like, special? To, to like, do something significant with it. And I don't know if she used those words or whatever, but that was the nature of the conversation. Like, like what, what would it look like for me to pursue awesomeness here? And, and part of that was she wanted to play D1 volleyball, and um, part of that was, you know, she, she just, like, wanted to have significance in, in her role as a libero, which is a highly defensive player. You don't get a lot of, like, you don't get a lot of love as a libero. She's not tall. She's not finishing points. She's kind of the defensive person who, who runs around on the floor and gets all the balls. And, and, and so at that point, we were able to say, like, hey, so there, there's a few things that, that will accompany that, Caroline. Um, you're, there's, there's a few ways for you, if you will, to um, set your sails in order to catch this dream you have of being a special volleyball player. One of them is you're gonna have to get in the gym more. You're gonna have to see reps. You're gonna have to like um, find a way to get in the gym. And so what she did is she not only went to her scheduled practices, that she would, she would um, go to other people's practices, both on teams that were younger than her and teams that were older than her. She would get in the gym individually with coaches and work on particular skills. She became uh, increasingly aware of what she ate and slept and, and all those sort of things and, and how that would affect um, her training and, and her performance. And then when it came time for her to uh, look at um, playing at the next level in, in, in college, uh, she began sending out emails to all of these coaches across the country and introducing herself. And then she got on the phone, and if you know my daughter, that's a super uncomfortable thing for her to do, to get on the phone with another adult and talk about anything, much less the thing that she loves the most. And so she was talking to college coaches all the time. Hey, this is my, ne this is my next tournament. This and so she, she was doing all of these things that would not guarantee her 
her, her, her desired outcome. It, it, there was no system that if you did these things, you're definitely going to be able to have your D1 scholarship and to be a special significant player and to kind of like leave a legacy with, with who you are in this sport. There's, there's, it's not a formula, but what she understood is that there were, there were some things that she could do in order to prepare so that that environment might become more of a reality. Do you understand? She, wasn't earn, she didn't earn anything. She simply prepared herself in such a way where that preferred future became more and more of a reality. So as we think here about the Holy Spirit, the, the call is to set your sail. The call is to figure out what are the things that I can do that will set my sail, that will drop my sails in order that when the wind of the Holy Spirit, which is one of the, one of the word pictures that God says about his Holy Spirit, when the wind of the Holy Spirit blows, it will catch my sails and it will lead me to those places of significance and awesomeness for his name's sake. And that, that, that's what we want to look at. To, what are some of those things that I can do to prepare to be filled with God's Holy Spirit? Francis Chan, in his book, Forgotten God, which I cannot recommend high enough if you're interested in the things of the Holy Spirit and you'd like to, to do a bit more of a study, it's a great, easy read. Francis Chan, Forgotten God, says that I don't want to have lived a life that could be explainable outside of God's Holy Spirit. I don't want you to look at my life and say, that was a good, awesome, moral dude. I want you to look at my life and thus the church that he was a part of and say, I have no explanation for why he did the things he did outside of he was under the influence of something. It just happened to be the Holy Spirit. And so if that's your goal, if that's your, if that's your desire, that you would have a purposeful, significant part in God's redemptive history, which there's no greater desire, then there are a few things that we need to be doing on a constant basis that help us to set our sails and prepare for the only person who can take us there. You might want me to be super significant right now and, and, and like bust open your mind with some new insightful things that will help set your sails. I'm going to under-deliver prepare. It's going to get super boring right now. You ready? Here's like number one. Read your Bible. And then, and then, check this out. It's, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to continue to disappoint you. Read your Bible again. And then wake up and do it again, and again, and again. And then do it some more, and then get with some people who have also read their Bible and start talking to them about like, what's going on here? What did you see? What's God speaking to you? What's, and so don't just read your Bible alone. Actually, don't just read your Bible. Read your Bible and then, and then process it. Mark it up. Write something. Think about something. Do something beyond just reading and being a consumer of the Word. Interact with the Word somehow, some way. Take a picture of it and text me. Do something with the Word because when you, when you read it, you consume it. That's, that's good. But when you interact with it, then it starts messing you up. And that's even better. Read the word. Interact with the word. Get around other people who do the same thing. Pray. Pray all the time. Before you enter into any situation. I'm not talking about like the, the times where Jesus got away and prayed and it seemed like, where is he? And somebody had to go find him. You don't have to do that. I'm, I'm, that's a good thing to do. But what I'm talking about is just pray all the time. Like, thank you for this. Thank you for that. Thank you for the coffee here this morning on a morning when I barely made it to, to this church. Thank you for this person. Thank you for this situation. Father, help me as I head into the... Lord, let me have a heart that learns and hears from you. Pray. Read your Bible. Be in community. Listen and sing worship songs outside of here. It's hard to have a melody on your heart that sings to Jesus when the world screams a different anthem at you all the time. And your flesh actually wants to hear it. Interrupt that with worship. Prepare. These are things that we can do to prepare ourselves to be filled with the wind of God's dominating Holy Spirit. Well, what else could we do? I love this one. 
Can we go to the next slide, please? I think I have it as a, as a verse. If you then, who are evil, that's a great start. That's Jesus, by the way. It's not like some country preacher, like, throwing it down. It's like Jesus. He's like, yo, even though all you evil dads out there, and, you know, it's, it's cool if Jesus says it, but, like, when we say it, we're like, that's so insulting. I, so I'm just going to preach Jesus. Okay, if you then who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? This is awesome stuff. Because here's what I know. I know how to give good gifts. Check out slide number whatever we are. Go to the next one, please. Yeah, there it is. There it is. So my three-year-old son, Cade, and I, we, I get him from school, and oftentimes I park the car somewhere in Delray, so we have to walk to it, and we go on these adventure walks. And the other day, he asked me, he was like, hey, Dad, um, can, can, Daddy, can we get some uh, ice cream? And I was like, of course, yeah, absolutely. I can make that happen. And so what we did is we walked ourselves all the way to Sloan's, and I was like, what kind of ice cream do you want? And he's like, I want blue so we looked at the counter, and there was blue, unbeknownst to us. There were gummy worms in there. I mean, gummy bears, not worms. You can maybe see one of them, like, right here. Okay, and so what happened was, um, you know, we ate that, and, and we sat there, and, and we were, like, just enjoying. Our tongues were getting blue. I was super worried, no lie. That, and I, and I, if you would have walked by me, you would have seen me looking very weird because I was chewing all of these gummy bears in the front of my teeth because I thought they were going to pull out my fillings. That's how like cold they were. In the, I can't remember the last time I ate gummy bears that were cold. Anyways, so I, we were there, and, and when, when he came up, I was like, man, do you want a cup or a cone? And because I'm an evil dad that still knows how to give my son good gifts, he's like, I'm gonna, I want, a, I want a, 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 a cone, which I know is like a horrific decision for my three-year-old. It just gets everywhere. And the lady said, we have something that does both. And so if you look at this, it's both a cup and a cone. I know how to hook my little man up. And so we sat out there, we had the best time with this good gift that I gave him. And it gave me great pleasure to give him this gift. As a matter of fact, I didn't just give him the good gift. I sat there with him and we gummied it up, man. We ate, we looked at each other, we took pictures. It was amazing. I knew exactly where to go. I had enough money to cover it, and we got to enjoy the gift together. How much more does your heavenly Father know how to radically give you the best of who he is through his Holy Spirit when we ask? When we ask. Listen, I love ice cream and I love my son, but we would not have been eating that ice cream had he not asked. We would have gone to the car and we would have gone home and we would have done something cool. It would have been, but we would not have had that moment. Jesus says, can we get that passage back up? About the, the last one in Luke. If then you already know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the heavenly father... Give the Spirit to those who ask Him. So you want to know one of the things that we can do in order to prepare to receive the Holy Spirit? The spiritual rhythms that I talked about, reading your Bible and praying and being in community, serving, all those things are super important. But one of the things I think sometimes we forget as Christians is to simply ask our dad, who's like, I'm so glad you asked. Here you go. You wanted one scoop. I've got it. It's like if we could just get our minds around the fact that God loves to give us good gifts, the best of which is his Holy Spirit, it might change the way we thought about preparing for life even today. Well, maybe, maybe you're, you're asking yourself the question, but like, like, does this include me? Does this include me? I mean, if you're, if you're following along in your outline, there's three blanks there, and, and what I want you to write down, if you're a writer, is set your sails. Just write that down. Set your sails. Because hopefully that, God's going to take his Holy Spirit, and he's going to write that on your heart. Set your sails. Do whatever you have to do in order to prepare for God to blow his Holy Spirit and fill you in ways that you've maybe never been filled before. But you might be asking the question, is this for me? What about me? 
Nikki Gumbel from Holy Trinity Brompton in London, one of the main architects of what we now study as Alpha, gives us this illustration, we'll go to that next slide, of people who were filled with the Holy Spirit in the New Testament, and, and maybe you're on here. So in Acts 2, and you have all these scriptures in your, in your outline, in Acts 2, you're going to see people who were longing for the Holy Spirit. They were waiting for the Holy Spirit. So they were like, yes, more, more, more. That might be you this morning. In Acts 8, you were gonna see, you're going to see people who were receptive to it. They had, they had heard about Jesus, and they were kind of like, oh, yeah, the Holy Spirit, yes. Like, we, we, need, we need that. We, we want to engage that. And so longing is different than receptive, but if you're receptive, if you're like, yeah, like, I want that. I want. Some, people are, some people came in here hungry, like, man, if I don't, if I, if this, like, if God doesn't encourage me and fill me, and like, I'm, I, I need that. I'm, I'm desperate for God. Some of you aren't there, and that's okay. You can still be filled with the Holy Spirit. You just have to be receptive to it. Like, okay, God wants to do that? Man, I love blueberry ice cream. I'm in. All right, hostile. In Acts 9, we find somebody that was hostile to it. His name was Saul, who then became Paul, and he, watch this, this is kind of cool. He, 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 he was persecuting the church. And then God was like, no more for you, bro. Ice cream, boom. And it was over for Saul, who then became Paul. So you might be hostile here this morning. The love of God is just about to knock you out. Unlikely. Some of you are like, that's not me. Like, I like, that sounds a little charismatic. Like, I, I don't know where he's going. I don't, I don't know where, like, what's happening. He's talking a lot about the Holy Spirit. And you're like, I don't think so. Well, sometimes you're like preparing. You're like in your word. And, you're, and, and you came and, and guess what? You might think, like, that's not necessarily for me. I, you know, I'm not, I don't understand what. But God still has a different agenda for you, even this morning. Um, and, and then uninformed. Some of you are like, what? Are you, what's this dude talking about? Acts 19. First, you're like, no, I never heard of that. That's cool. You can play too. Here's how we're going to finish. Let me set your expectations. Let me set your expectations for what to think about. Um, There's two things that are, that are definitely going to happen. Um, guaranteed. I don't know what order. But I'm going to talk about the first one that's the unfortunate one first. And you're going to go to war. You're going to engage yourself in a war that you may not have known you signed up for. It's happening to me this morning, right now, as I preach this message. I'm at war with some of my old enemies, the whispers and things like that's happening right now. And any of you who pray for me in the midst of messages and things like that, like there's been an even freedom in the midst of that, but I've been at war the last 15, 20 minutes, just letting you know. Because God hates when I preach this stuff. He would much rather me preach some sort of like do good, try harder message, not like get desperate for the Holy Spirit. So I'm here, but I'm at war, man. If you seek more of God, if you seek to be filled with God's Holy Spirit, the New Testament is clear that, that the flesh and the enemy named Satan hate the things of the Spirit. And they not only hate each other, but they war with each other. So if you're like, yeah, man, I'm going to prepare. It's going to be awesome. I'm going to start asking. You can expect, like, Tuesday could be minorly horrific for you. You take that step. It happens to me all the time. I'm like, I trust you. I repent. I'm here. And I'm like, feel everything inside of me calling me back. And when I'm in a good place, I'm reminded that I'm at war and I'm a warrior. And I've been, spilled, and I've been filled not with a spirit of fear, but a spirit of adoption that says, Abba, Father, I'm going to keep going because of who you are in me. When I remember that I'm at war, that there's something going on inside of me. The second thing that's going to happen is God's Holy Spirit is going to pour out the love of God into your heart. Check out this. Uh, do I have that as a verse? I know it's on your outline. What's our next slide? Yeah. 
The love of God is poured into our hearts by the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. You know what one of Paul's prayers was uh, for the church? That they would have strength to understand, not to witness, not to withstand sin, not to like be better at whatever they are, but they would have strength to understand the depths and the heights and the wits by which God has loved them. When you're filled with the Holy Spirit, one of the greatest um, outcomes of it is this like sense of freedom and passion and power. Not that you love God, but that He loves you and you are free and you can rest and you can move and you can operate in a different way than you've ever operated before because shame guilt, the condemnation, it's not part of you anymore. Christ took it and has different and better. You're loved right where you are overwhelmingly. Stop right where you are before you go and prepare, before you do this, before you do that, before you fix this, before you wreck it, before you, before, before anything right now, the love of God The Holy Spirit can only tell you this. I'm not that great at explaining it because I'm not that great at believing it. But here's what I prayed for, that as, like, in this moment, the love of God would come and overwhelm you and that the Holy Spirit would fill you and you would begin to believe in ways that you've never believed, that the Father is not just with you, but the Father is for you today, exactly as you are. And so I thought it might be cool for us to end with a visual of some people who are getting this more and more and more and are publicly setting their sails in faith and obedience, taking a step of baptism that says, yes, Jesus, I want more of you. Check this out. I wasn't really sure that anything was going to change, but I knew that I loved Jesus. An outward expression of that new birth that had taken place in me. The whole church family there supporting me, and I didn't even know these people yet, and uh, they would soon become my family. An outward sign of an inward work. Our old life has been washed away and come out of the water is our new life and that's what we celebrate now. Yeah, we can give it up. That was awesome. A couple of Saturdays ago, There were those individuals who were like, man, I'm going to set my say, I'm going to give it up, I'm going to surrender to what God is doing publicly because he calls me to do this. Make it, I'm going to go public with Jesus. And I'm going to, I'm going to receive the invitation of grace for more of God. I'm going to repent, turn my life over to Christ and believe that he is enough. And I'm going to proclaim it through baptism. If you want to talk about setting your sail. Those people have set their sails, and we can set our sails this morning by simply praying an ancient prayer that the church has prayed for years. Come, Holy Spirit, come. I'm going to ask our prayer partners to come forward, and we're going to have the the team behind us just play for a little bit. They're going to play a little piece of the song that I I don't want you to sing. I want it to be sung over you. And so we're going to to dismiss here as I pray, but I'm going to, as the the prayer partners come forward, I'm going to ask you... If the love of God is something that you've been struggling, you're like in a season where you're like, man, I I know it here, but I need to know it here. The only one who can get that for you is the Holy Spirit. If you want prayer in that way, I'm gonna gonna invite you to come forward. We're gonna gonna get with somebody, they're gonna lay hands on you, they're gonna pray over you in that direction. And the song that's gonna be behind me is about the love of the Father. And so let's just practice what we believe now as a church. Father, We ask that you would send your Holy Spirit.
come, Holy Spirit, come and fill us. Our sails are prepared. We ask you for your anointing, for your filling, for the love of the Father to take us to places we've never been before. We pray this in the name of Christ. Amen and amen. You are dismissed.